Didn't the other kids tell you not to come here? Go back, go back, before it's too late! Go back, go back. At the heart of horror, there has always been more than spooks and scares. Sometimes, it's not what you see, but what you hear. Welcome to Sound Scary. Each week, we talk to the artists, the musicians, the fans, the people who haunt the shadowy corners of your mind. Join us as we delve into the deepest, darkest, and most unforgettable earscapes. Welcome to Sound Scary. Uh, welcome to another episode of Sound Scary. I'm your host, Ryan Coltrero. And I'm Jimmy O, and I'm really excited about tonight's guest. Uh, Amber Seeley has one of the best films I've seen as of late about serial killers. It's something that we've never covered on this particular show. Amber, how did you get involved with this story and this beautiful script? Yeah, it was so special. I mean, it, it came to me through the normal channels. My, my manager, you know, the script came to my manager. Um, my manager sent it to me to consider. And my first thought was like, me and a Bundy film? Like, that's not a sort of, no one who, who knew my previous work would have assumed that I would be a good fit for a Bundy film. But I thought, well, what the hell, I'll read it. It was such a beautiful read. It's such a great script. And, and it just, you know, I flew through it. And I had a vision. And I was like, well, you know, because sometimes you read something and you're like, I just don't connect to this. And sometimes you read it and you're like, I, I have a, a vision for this film. And I thought, well, you know what? What the hell? I'll go in and I'll pitch on it. I really like, I'd heard of SpectreVision. I really liked the, you know, what I'd heard about them and heard about Elijah. Of course, you know, I've always been a fan of Elijah's. And um, so I went in and I did gave my pitch. And I thought, you know, if they like it, great. If they don't, great. It doesn't matter. You know, I just kind of give my take. And uh, and they loved it. And so it just immediately felt like a meeting of minds, you know, like um, they really took to my take on the film and and I really took to them as producers because I felt like they um, they really they're really like filmmakers. They really, you know, they, they get into the muck with you and they're really there to support your vision. And they did that throughout, throughout the whole process. You know, they were really like, we want to make your movie. We're, we're not here to kind of tell you what kind of movie you have to make. And, um, and it was just a wonderful process. I mean, I think it was very life affirming also because was, you know, the, the beginning of the pandemic, we were one of the first movies, um, to come out after everything shut down, you know, in March and April. We were one of the first movies in Los Angeles to come back and, and film. Um, and so it was a kind of powerful experience for all of us because we hadn't been out of our homes <laughs> for like wow. six months, you know? Yeah. yeah. And what one of the things that I loved about your film was its uh, restraint. Because I, I watch a lot of true crime. And one of the things I love about your movie is for a character who is defined by death and the salacious like you don't show any of that like i feel like it's so easy to portray ted bundy as kind of this charming roguish devil in so many things and i love the way that you put him on screen can you talk about your approach to this character yeah well so we were really lucky in that we had the real bill hagmeyer you know mm. he was, he's a producer on the film and we had him and in his involvement and he just gave us such a treasure trove of information and intel and he gave us these actual recordings that he had made with Bundy. They're hours. Wow. I mean, he met with him over a period of five years and each time they'd sit down for two to three hours. And so we had the actual, you know, Bundy and Bill's real conversations. And so listening to those, what really struck me was like, he's a sort of incel guy, you know, he's a narcissistic, like definitely mm -hmm. a psychopath and, and definitely self-obsessed. You know, that was what stood out to me was like his insecurity, his desperate need for Bill to think he was smart, to think he was interesting, to think he, you know, could have also been a profiler, that jumped out at me from their recorded conversations. Mm. And so that was the part that that drew me in was I was like, yeah, he's he's 
you know, he's, I don't think he's stunning. He's good looking. He's, you know, I think he was, they sort of built him up to be much better looking than he really was. I mean, if you really look at the photos, you're like, he's fine looking, but he mostly just looked like a normal guy. I think that was why people got drawn in because a lot of serial killers, you look at them and you go, oh, wow, yeah, that guy's scary. I would cross yeah. the street. If I... Whereas Bundy looked like a normal guy, you know, but I don't think he looked like a model. Um, I mean, I think Luke Kirby is much better looking than Ted Bundy was personally. But, yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah. But, um, I think, you know, he was just an average looking guy. And, and somehow there's been this mythologizing of him as that he was this mastermind, you know, he, mm. he was just lured people in. And really what he did was he looked normal and he appealed to women's sense of helping others. You know, he, 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 he realized that women are socialized to help people and to take care of people. Mm -hmm. And so he was like, oh, if I'm wearing an arm brace and I can't hold all my books or I have, I'm having trouble making it up the stairs, carrying yeah. something, a woman is going to stop and help me, particularly a young woman, you know, because that's how we're told, that's how we're raised to be always nice and please people and help people and never upset anyone and always make everyone like you. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you know, he realized that he was smart enough to realize that. Um, but but after that, I don't I don't think he was like a a genius at all. You know, I mean, I think um, it's really clear to me from the recorded conversations with with Bill that he was, you know, he was intelligent, but not he wasn't as smart as he wanted to think he was or wanted people to think he was. That was right. really important to him. That others thought he was really smart, and Bill saw that. Bill was like, this guy needs to know that i think he's smart and that i think he could be a profiler he could be a cop you know wow um one thing that is, was interesting that bill uh, that, that uh, bill told me was that in their conversations bundy uh never liked to refer to himself when he was talking about crimes he would say well you know if a guy were to do this a guy would mm. do and he would hardly ever say i and a few times he messed up and he did say i and mm. bill was really smart he realized that when ted did that ted would get flustered and and be embarrassed and would kind of retreat and sometimes want to end the conversation and so bill would go oh i'm sorry ted what was it you were saying i i was my mind wandered from and I didn't hear you. And he would pretend that he didn't hear Bundy say I to keep Bundy. Wow. You know, wow. In the yeah. I, I gotta say, you know, going in, you know, I was thinking a lot about serial killers, especially in the 70s. It was such a shockingly popular. <laughs> popular terrible popular. Word to use but yes it was a, it was very common it was a busy it was a busy time busy yeah. time <laughs> it, it must be how did you feel like emotionally like physically basically demystifying this 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 kind of horrible legend in a way kind of boogeyman boogeyman yeah, yeah. no yeah. it's a good question i mean i think i think i didn't because it well, i wasn't the first one to do that you know mm. i feel like there were, I mean, there were before me. There were twenty movies made about Bundy. There are now twenty-two, including mine. You know, and so there was so there was such a wealth of written and videoed information for me to, you know. So I wasn't like I don't have to crack this guy for the first time. I just felt like I was adding my perspective, which was different from the others that had come before, you know. But I feel like cracking who he was had kind of already been done, you know. I I definitely felt like for Hollywood, he had been portrayed as more glamorous than I took him to be. Yeah. So I was doing my version, which was, a, like I said, a much more insecure, narcissistic guy. Um, but what was more interesting to me was cracking Bill. Like I was more fascinated with who is this guy who has to sit so close to evil? Like, how does he mm -hmm. maintain his sanity? How does he maintain being a good person you know and he is truly like he's a he's a, a devoted husband a devoted father a devoted grandfather like he's really just a sweet sweet generous giving guy and i thought how does someone like that you know if your job is just surrounding yours i mean he worked with eileen wernos he worked with so many oh, famous wow. serial killers. yeah you and probably every famous serial killer you've heard of that was alive then he worked with them um and so i just was fascinated with you know, how do you not go crazy? If yeah. I did that, I think I would go crazy. You know, I already, I was just saying, I have some, I have some pictures that Bill Hagmeyer sent me here in my office that are of Bundy, that, that are the act, the wow. actual. Oh my gosh. That's like, wild. These are the pictures, you know, in the, that were in the room. 
and I just was like, I don't want these. I have children, you know, and I was like, I don't want these. I had to like put them away in a box because I just was thinking, yeah. I don't want, you know. <laughs> so, but maybe it speaks to my, I don't know. I, it didn't, it didn't deeply affect me. You know, I didn't look into too much, you know, like the specifics of his crimes. I mean, I didn't need to see photos of beheaded women. And, you know, yeah. I did mm -hmm. learn that, you know, that almost every serial killer and I mean, literally, almost everyone is a um, uh, necrophilia, right? That's when you have sex with them after they mm -hmm. yeah. are dead. Yeah. Um, that was something that Bill also told me. So that was, you know, of course, gross to learn. But I also think it's just another yeah. indicator of like those people are not well in yeah. their, you know, they're not all there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. It didn't. I didn't have nightmares. I don't know if that says something bad about me, but I didn't have nightmares. <laughs> I didn't like worry more. I mean, maybe part of it is that like, you know, because of the pandemic, we're hardly leaving our house. You know? So yeah. it wasn't like I was walking down a dark street and, and feeling scared. <laughs> it's like, I'm just in my pajamas at home. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I was more worried, honestly, about the pandemic and the safety and health of the crew. I wanted yeah. to keep everybody alive. You know that would have been the worst for somebody to have gotten COVID and died. Oh know, my gosh! Filming. I just I never would have gotten over that. So we really luckily had no positive cases. We kept everybody healthy and safe, which awesome. was really. Yeah. It's it's good to hear for sure. Yeah. <laughs> now um... well, I just have to say I'm loving your cricket bat behind you. Ah, thank you. <laughs> It's it's a Shaun of the Dead cricket bat. Yeah, I yes. I did I did two movies with Simon Pegg. Him and I really? played, he played husband and wife in a, in a, a movie and and then yeah yeah we I lived in England for a long time. So. Oh no oh, kidding! Wow. wow. Oh that's very cool. Yeah, he's sweet. He he is an excellent guy. When I I have been to a couple of little events with him. <laughs> yeah yeah. Now um, one of the one of the things I like you did that you did with this film is kind of by using the uh, the kind of the, the grotesque kind of back and forth of showing these people outside celebrating this execution, I felt like you were kind of holding a mirror up to our culture's obsession with true crime. Uh, why, why do you think like we're so into true crime right now? There's a million podcasts and, but it shows that we've always kind of been into that. I'm so glad you picked up on that. Yeah, I mean, you know, look, we're all guilty of that. It wasn't, I'm not trying to hold up a mirror to just fans of the genre, you know, it's mm -hmm. it's more like all of us. I mean, I do think there's something human about, uh, well, I mean, it's the rubbernecking on the freeway, right? You drive yeah. by a car crash, you look, it's, it's, yeah. in a sense, I want to assume that it comes from a place of caring. We, we all know what it feels like to be scared. We all know what it feels like to be worried to, about dying. And so I think that when we're confronted with somebody else's fear and or death, it's interesting to us, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I like true crime a fair amount. I'm not a huge fan. I don't watch a ton of it, but I, you know, I certainly watch the big, the stuff that comes up that's in the zeitgeist that everybody's talking about. Um, and I think it's just a very human thing to, 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 to feel for ourselves and for others, that feeling of, of, death that's fear of death you know i mean i think it's yeah. really as simple as that you know and and when like i said you know the rubbernecking on the freeway it's like it's it's i just i i like to assume that it comes from a good place that it comes from a like we care about other people it's it's very emotional to see other people in pain and i mm. think that cinema is about mm. us wanting to experience those large emotions happiness sadness fear you know and so I think people that particularly enjoy that genre, it's just that's their way of connecting to other humans, you know, is going through that feeling of being afraid. You know, mm -hmm. we all do it in different ways. Some of us like roller coasters, some of us, you know, like to eat a lot of ice cream. You know, I just think we all are, we wanna feel those big feelings. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, and this is just part of that. Well, yeah. for, we've got one more question and I, I really, it means a lot that you joined us. Uh, Speaking of humanity, there is a, 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 a big heart, a big level of humanity here. Mm -hmm. There's also the, the title, uh, No Man of God. There's that slight religion, religious. Uh, how Did you talk a lot that uh, with Bill about putting that into his character and bringing that and making it be a part of his who he was? 
Mm-hmm. Well, you know, to me that, yeah, the title, no man of God, you know, it refers to Bundy. Like we, yeah. we don't think he is a man of, a man of God. You know, the, the writer is a, a, a believer in God and very religious. I am spiritual, not religious. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Bill Hagmeyer himself is a very faithful believer in God. Um, and so to me, it was really, all that was just so interesting was like, how do we all connect to uh, the concept of trying to be good, trying to be a good person. You know, for some of us, it's God. For other of us, it's acts of service. You know, whatever it is, it's it's something different for each of us. Um, but I was really interested in um, Bill's religion. You know, I mean, he is a mm-hmm. really religious guy. And that ultimately, like, I, you know, I talked about earlier, how do you sit so close to evil and, and not become evil yourself? Well, right. for Bill, the answer was belief in God. You know, he really does believe in um, following the word of the Lord. And it really like, you know, um, keeps him ha- happy and healthy and pure and, and mentally clear, you know, and then you have somebody like Alexa Paladino's character, the lawyer, you know, um, she doesn't believe in God. She's not religious, but she just really thinks the death penalty is wrong. So for her, you know, she has to find other ways um, to stay true or altruistic or um, and then and then I think Bundy was really like someone who was in between. He was ra- raised in a religious f- uh, family and home. His mother was religious, but I personally don't think he did actually believe in God. Um, Bill told me another thing, which is that there are no atheists on death row. And I think that that was just what happened to Bundy, that basically mm. when he got to, you know, the time where he was going to be executed, he wanted to believe in God desperately because then he could, then he was going to be offered redemption and salvation yeah. if yeah. he believed. Mm. But I th- I don't think he ultimately did believe. So to me, it's like we have these different ends of the spectrum. You've got you know, Carolyn, the lawyer who doesn't believe, you've got Bill who does believe, and then you've got Bundy in the middle who's like desperately wants to believe. Um, so to me, it just was, I wasn't trying to pass any judgment on religion in any way. It was more just like presenting the different ways that people have relationship to the concept of God. Well, then, and, well, and for Bill, there was never any question because it's just, you know, it's just a big part of who he is. When you talk mm-hmm. to him, you can see, you know, I never had to talk about it with him because it was just really obvious that that, I mean, he was, he told me, God is how I got through it. You know, my, my faith, yeah. well, my faith and my family. This well, is an excellent it, film. It really was. It's, it's, it's really. such a, a, a interesting, intimate character piece and just a very delicate topic to tackle, which you, you absolutely nailed. Like, I think you portrayed it perfectly. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So We're both very big fans of it. Yeah, thank, thank you, so you for much. joining us very much. And please, everyone, see No Man of God. It's a, it's fantastic. Definitely. Really fantastic. Thank you for joining us, Amber. Thank you, guys. Take Great care. talking with you. Thank You're you. You're amazing. All You're right. terrific. Thank Have a good you. one. <laughs> Bye. Bye. You think you're smarter than him. You think you're going to be the one that's going to get him to confess. Well, I don't think I'm smarter, sir. I don't think you necessarily have to be smarter. This is what's gonna happen. He will come down. He'll toy with you for a little while. Does your son know what you do? He knows his daddy protects people. He will cat and mouse with you. He will make you think you are getting somewhere. Let's record and let's get this party started. It is February 13th, 1986. This is Agent Bill Hagmeyer. I'm sitting with Theodore. No, Ted. I'm sitting with Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy has 13 hours to live, and he is using those hours to try and buy himself more time. He's ready to talk. He said he's ready to confess to everything, but I only talk to one person. There are families out there looking for answers. The world needs to know why he killed those girls. You're some hotshot young upstart, and I'm your next big case. You're going to be the guy who broke me. There are a lot of myths and misunderstandings about me. What are you going to tell me? Everything. What do you think he wants? You and I will sit down and have the conversation you've wanted this whole time. When you get too close to a guy like this, you can lose your way. Do you think you could kill somebody? I'm an FBI agent. That's not what I'm saying. You can't hold these girls hostage. I'm not playing games. How many did you kill? Let's say 30. Let's say we talk about the real number. 30 is a nice round number. You're getting inside my head. I'm looking for understanding. You think they should kill me, don't you? You think it's my time to die? Frankly, they probably should have done it a long time ago. I'm going to take you somewhere that I've never taken anyone before. I need a moment with Bill. He's my best friend.